happy Saturday. Today we are going back to 2015 with our episode on Virginia Apgar, who developed the Apgar score for newborn babies. And I have a soft spot for her because she reminds me of my grandmother. Although my grandmother didn't walk around with everything she would need to do an emergency tracheotomy just in her handbag. <laughs> that was not how my grandmother operated. No, I think my grandmother maybe could have cobbled together the required items, but, <laughs> but it wasn't necessarily her goal. One of the things that we talked about in this episode is how when Apgar started practicing medicine, there was a lot more focus on what was going on with laboring mothers than on what was going on with their newborns. And that focus has really swung in the opposite direction in the decades since then, to the point that there have been a lot of headlines and studies about an ongoing maternal health crisis in the three years since this episode came out. So that's part of this whole arc of history that is definitely still developing. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. So if you've, if you've had a baby in like the last 60 years or been present when somebody else had a baby or maybe even just watched a TV show in which babies were born, you've probably heard people talking about Apgar scores. Yeah, but I never gave it much thought, not being particularly a baby person. So yeah, I I thought this was an acronym. And while somebody did rework the parts of the APGAR score so that it matched up with the letters of her name in about 1962, the score uh, itself is from earlier than that. And it's the work of Dr. Virginia APGAR, who really broke new ground in the fields of obstetrics and anesthesiology, uh, as well as other fields in the middle of the 20th century. Today, the APGAR score is really part of the standard of care for new for newborn babies in much of the world, and it's totally to the credit of this one particular doctor. And this one particular doctor, Virginia APGAR, was born in Westfield, New Jersey on June 7th of 1909. Her father was an insurance executive who was fond of science and was an amateur astronomer. And she also had a brother who died of tuberculosis at a very young age. So it's possible that both of these things influenced her decision to become a doctor. But regardless, that decision was made before she even got out of high school. To that end, she went to Mount Holyoke College where st she studied zoology. In addition to being an excellent student in that program, she worked several part-time jobs to make ends meet. Then she also played the cello and the violin in the orchestra and acted and wrote for the college newspaper and played on seven different sports teams. She sounds like a medical school version of Leslie Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great description. Uh, her family, she described her family at one point as just people who never sat still. And that's just, she seems to have been constantly doing her whole life. Uh, she graduated in 1929, and she started medical school at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons that same year. There were 90 people in her class, and she was one of only nine women. She scraped together enough money to stay in school in spite of the Great Depression, and she graduated near the top of her class in 1933. So she really wanted to become a surgeon, and she was accepted into a surgical internship at Presbyterian Hospital, which is now New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center. She did really well in her first year of this residency, but Dr. Alan Whipple, who was the chair of the surgical department, encouraged her to change specialties to anesthesiology. He was concerned that she would not be able to make a profitable career as a surgeon, especially given the economic climate at the time. This was still in the wake of the Great Depression. He also basically had other plans for her. He wanted her to study anesthesiology and then come back to Presbyterian Hospital to help start a teaching program for future anesthesiologists. There were lots of reasons for Dr. Apgar to change specialties. It was definitely difficult for women to be respected as surgeons at this point. And there were lots of trained surgeons, so competition for jobs was really stiff. And Dr. Apgar would have had to stand out even more because of her gender. Dr. Whipple had seen his other female surgical students really have trouble getting hired as surgeons at all. And Dr. Apgar had graduated from medical school in debt, so taking on a specialty in which she would probably have trouble finding a job was a really risky proposition. At the same time, by, beco by becoming an anesthesiologist instead of a surgeon, she was really setting out to pursue a specialty that did not even really exist yet, 
As recently as 1911, the American Medical Association had even rejected a request to start an anesthesia section for its members. So while Dr. Apgar essentially had a job waiting for her after she was done with her study of anesthesiology, it was going to be a tough one because it was in a specialty that was not regarded as a specialty. So let's talk about why that was for a moment. Um, For most of Western medical history, surgery was actually seen as inferior to the rest of medicine. So before things like modern anesthesia and the germ theory of disease, surgeons mostly performed things like amputations, and it was not always likely that their patients were going to survive. Eventually, as developments in medicine made it possible for people to live through surgeries without bleeding to death or immediately dying from infection, surgery only gradually became a more respected field. So surgeons had to basically claw their way to respectability. And for the most part, in the early days of surgery as a more prestigious position, anesthesia was being administered by nurses. Now, I want to be super clear on this. Nurse anesthetists are still a really important part of the field of anesthesiology today. But at the time, instead of working under the direction of anesthesiologists who were specialists in how to keep a patient simultaneously unconscious and pain-free and medically stable, nurse anesthetists were usually working under the direction of the surgeon who was performing the procedure. This meant that even as advances in surgical techniques and infection control practices meant patients could survive longer and more complex surgeries, anesthesiology wasn't advancing quickly enough to keep up. Outside of teaching and research hospitals, where surgeons might be dedicating some of their focus uh, to anesthesia, this just was not the priority. And then there was the basic fact that keeping a patient properly anesthetized while also performing a surgical procedure is really a lot to juggle at one time. Plus, after having been viewed as inferior to doctors for so long, a lot of surgeons just did not want to hand over control of part of the surgical process to another person, even if the person they were going to be handing it off to was somebody whose sole focus was on being the best in the world of anesthesiology. So Dr. Whipple hoped that he and Dr. Apgar might work together to change all of that. And we're going to talk about that some more. But first, we're going to have a word from a sponsor. So to get back to Dr. Whipple and Dr. Apgar's plans for anesthesiology, Dr. Whipple basically thought that Dr. Apgar might really have a knack for this. He described her as having, quote, the energy, intelligence, and ability needed to make significant contributions in this area. Because anesthesiology wasn't yet recognized as a specialty for medical doctors, there really weren't a lot of training programs for it at this point. There were 13 of them in the United States, ranging in length from two weeks to three years, and only two of those were actually paid residencies. Neither of these residency programs had a spot open when Dr. Apgar applied. Yeah, obviously, like, a two-week training program in anesthesiology is not, <laughs> not nearly the same thing as the work that it would be needed to, to take on a new medical specialty. Right? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> wide, that's a wide range, a two-week to three-year plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So after finishing her second year of her surgical internship, doc- Dr. Apgar went through Presbyterian's training program for nurse anesthetists. She then spent six months studying under Dr. Ralph Waters at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in a visiting position. So Dr. Waters was really one of America's earliest pioneers in anesthesiology, and he just made critical and groundbreaking contributions to this field. Once she was done studying under Dr. Waters, she spent another six months with Dr. Ernest Rovestein in New York Bellevue Hospital. He had also trained with Dr. Waters, so it's you could easily call Dr. Waters like the the keystone in a lot of anesthesiology work in the United States at this point. So from there, in 1938, Dr. Apgar went back to Columbia University and Presbyterian Hospital and became the director of the Division of Anesthesia and an attending anesthetist. This made her the first woman to head a division at the hospital. Dr. Apgar and Dr. Whipple had formulated a plan for the Division of Anesthesia to become dedicated to training doctors to be anesthesiologists. But because of the prevailing attitudes running about anesthesiology at this point and the low pay that came along with them, she really had trouble recruiting peers to work with her. She was the only staff member in the division through the mid-1940s. 
But at the same time, she became a beloved teacher. As the existing staff of nurse anesthetists left the hospital to get married or pursue other jobs, residents filled their positions and studied anesthesiology under Dr. Apgar for between one and three years. And after the teaching program was solidly established, the division also turned its focus to research to improve the practice of anesthesiology. This was really a long and difficult process. For the first years of the program, Dr. Apgar only had a couple of residents, and she and a colleague had to write their textbook themselves because there was no anesthesiology textbook. It was 1945 before anesthesia was more often administered by doctors than by nurses at Presbyterian, which is really notable because at this point, the the whole point was trying to train new doctors. Gradually, though, perceptions about the validity of anesthesiology as a specialty started to improve, and it became recognized as a real specialty in 1946. Three years later, Dr. Apgar became the first woman to be named a full professor at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, Along with this, in the same year, the Division of Anesthesiology became its own department, and Dr. Emanuel Papper was selected to be the chair of that department. So Dr. Apgar had sort of thought she was going to be the person appointed to this position, but the fact that she no longer... Uh, had that department head kind of role to take up part of her time, she was able to focus a lot more on teaching and on her work in obstetric anesthesiology. During World War II, uh, many doctors and surgeons joined the military, which led to a labor shortage at Presbyterian Hospital and to Dr. Apgar's department having more involvement in the field of obstetric anesthesiology because the doctors and nurses who had been doing so had gone to serve. So at this point in the United States, uh, women had generally moved from usually delivering babies at home to usually delivering babies in the hospital. But this really hadn't improved outcomes for the women and their babies. Although infant mortality in general had dropped, the rate of infant mortality within the first 24 hours after birth had hardly budged, even though people were now being born in the presumably more medically safe area of a hospital. This is where Dr. Apgar really started to focus when she was freed up from her previous administrative duties as a department head. And it was known at that point that oxygen deprivation played a part in at least half of those babies' deaths. It seemed obvious to Dr. Apgar that if it became a standard practice to examine the baby and determine whether it needed oxygen and then give it oxygen if so, then a lot of these deaths could potentially be prevented. She was basically saying, y'all need to look at these babies. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, need to, you need to look at them. So, I mean, today this seems absurdly obvious. You should look at the baby. Make sure the baby is okay. But at the time, in delivery rooms, medical efforts tended to be a lot more focused on the mother than on the baby. A lot of times, the most junior people in the room were the ones who were seeing to the baby after it was born. They rarely had any training in anesthesiology or any knowledge of how the drugs that were used during a vaginal delivery or a cesarean section could affect a baby. Sometimes they were really, at the very beginning of their medical study, they just were not trained particularly well on uh, what to do when the baby came out. Yeah, and if they're that early on, they probably don't have the confidence to, like, make kind of snap decisions about treatment. Uh, plus, it's not going to come as a surprise to anyone who's ever witnessed uh, any conversation on the internet about people's opinions on childbirth. There was a whole lot of arguing going on about how to best deliver babies and not a whole lot of concrete data backing up people's opinions. And even when there was data, it was often disregarded in favor of what everybody, quote, already knew about it. So Dr. Apgar developed a standardized way of analyzing how the baby was doing after it was born. It involved evaluating five traits, the baby's heart rate, respiratory effort, muscle tone, reflex, and color, giving each of those a score of zero, one, or two. Then you add up those five numbers, and that's the baby's APGAR score. That mnemonic device that we mentioned at the top uh, of the episode substituted appearance for color, pulse for heart rate, grimace for reflex, uh, because babies make a grimacey face as a reflex, Activity for muscle tone and respiration, which was on the original list, uh, reportedly Dr. Apgar was quite delighted when uh, when a resident rewrote the letters in the Apgar score to match up with her name so they could remember what they all were. 
And what's really important is that she assigned actual measurable criteria to these. So a zero for heart rate meant that the heartbeat was absent. A two meant that the heartbeat was between 100 and 140 beats a minute. A zero for muscle tone meant that there was no muscle tone, and a two meant the baby was actively moving. It really got rid of a lot of the subjectivity in figuring out whether a baby was doing well or not. Yeah, so in addition to the extremely obvious, you need to look at the baby. (laughs) (laughs) It's like you need to look at the baby and measure these things, like, and it it will help you understand whether the baby needs to be resuscitated, whether the baby is thriving outside of the womb. She then conducted a study using this scoring method on 1,021 babies who were born at the Sloan Hospital for Women at Presbyterian. She found definite correlations between the method of delivery, the type of anesthesia used on the mother, and the baby's APGAR scores. She recommended that that newborn babies be evaluated a minute after their birth. And, also important, that someone other than the attending obstetrician do it. This was because she noticed a pattern that uh, OBs tended to score their, end quote, their babies that they delivered higher than other people in the delivery room did. This will sound familiar to anyone who has heard our episode on Dr. Vera Peters, who helped revolutionize the treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, When Dr. Apgar presented her paper at the 27th Annual Congress of Anesthetists in 1952, the audience was skeptical. But she published the work in 1953, and it has since become a standard of care in delivery rooms in much of the world, with the score measured once a minute after birth and again five minutes after birth. So basically, if the baby's score is not good after a minute, you need to resuscitate the baby. You do that, and then take it again in five minutes. Uh, it's This is one of those times where uh, it's kind of baffling uh, that this you know, you, now it's just such a standard thing. A baby is born and you check it out and you make sure everything's all right. Uh, this was not quite as big of a focus when the uh, medical team in the room was so much more focused on the mother than on both the mother and the baby. So, along with Dr. Duncan Holliday and Dr. Stanley James, Dr. Apgar went on to evaluate these correlations between delivery and the baby's Apgar scores They slowly connected the length and difficulty of the delivery and the types and amounts of anesthesia given to the mother, you know, whether it was a vaginal birth or a cesarean section, all these other things, with trends in the baby's scores. They figured out that babies with a score under three needed to be resuscitated, kind of obviously, uh, because that would be a baby that's like blue and not moving and doesn't have a pulse. Uh, But babies that have a score of seven to ten had a statistically better chance of surviving their first month of life than babies who scored six or lower. So that would be kind of a baby that's doing all right, but maybe not quite thriving. This evolving body of data allowed obstetricians and obstetric anesthetists to really refine their practices to improve newborn baby survival rates. And we haven't really talked about uh, the pretty massive differences between anesthesia that's typically used in delivery rooms now versus what was used (laughs) in the, the, like, 1950s. A totally different world um, in terms of like we it's not standard practice to put women essentially unconscious to deliver babies in American hospitals anymore. Dr. Apgar and team also went one step further and studied newborn babies' blood chemistry, finding clear physiological links between the outward appearance of the traits examined to calculate an Apgar st- score and what was actually physiologically going on in the baby's body. By the late 1950s, Dr. Apgar had attended more than 17,000 births. During that time, she had seen a a number of children who were born with congenital disabilities, also sometimes known as birth defects. And in some cases, it really seemed like there was a correlation between the disability and the baby's Apgar score. So in 1958, she went on a sabbatical, and she pursued a master's degree in public health from Johns Hopkins University. Originally, her intent was to improve her knowledge of statistics and bring that knowledge back to her work at Presbyterian Hospital, which increasingly involved statistics. But as she studied, she became increasingly interested in whether some of the congenital issues she was seeing when babies were born could somehow be prevented. During this time, she was approached by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which is now known as the March of Dimes. Originally, the National Foundation was primarily focused on polio, 
It had sponsored the vaccine research of Dr. Jonas Salk. And once the polio vaccine was introduced and the uh, the rate of polio infection just dropped dramatically, the foundation wanted to find a new place to expand its work and other uh, conditions that they could help with that were affecting babies and children. The foundation started a new department called the Division of Congenital Malformations. The National Foundation asked Dr. Apgar to lead this new department, and she accepted, beginning her new role after she completed her master's program. In this role, Dr. Apgar became a huge advocate of early detection and treatment of congenital issues, including prenatal testing and treatment. She traveled extensively to talk directly to parents and doctors and educators about congenital disabilities and other issues that were related to prenatal and newborn health. This was almost directly the opposite of her experience trying to start an anesthesiology program while that field was in its infancy. Congenital disabilities and disorders were huge news in the United States at this point. Uh, The drug thalidomide, which had been given to pregnant women in much of Europe, both as a sedative and to combat morning sickness, had been implicated in causing babies to be born with missing or incorrectly formed limbs. The FDA had not approved the drug to be used in the United States, which the media played up as a near miss. Uh, This was also during the post-war baby boom, so parents-to-be were hungry for information. And Dr. Apgar was really an ideal doctor to be involved in all this. She had decades of experience, and she was just extremely personable and empathetic and compassionate with the people she was talking to. In 1964 and 1965, a huge rubella outbreak in the United States led to more than 12 million cases of rubella and 20,000 cases of congenital rubella syndrome, which occurs when a pregnant woman contracts rubella. Congenital rubella syndrome can cause premature delivery, miscarriages, and stillbirths, and a wide variety of potential disorders and disabilities, which can affect virtually any system of the body. These include blindness, heart problems, bone lesions, hepatitis, and developmental disabilities. In the wake of this outbreak, Dr. Apgar led vaccination campaigns after one became available in 1969. She joined the faculty of the School of Pediatrics at Cornell University School of Medicine in 1965, and she taught there until 1974. She specialized in teratology, so sometimes this is characterized as a study of congenital disabilities, but it really incorporates any kind of uh, disability or disorder that arises as an organism is developing. So that can include like as a child is growing or transitioning into adolescence or things like that. Uh, She was actually the first person to hold a faculty position dedicated to this aspect of pediatrics. In 1972, Dr. Apgar was part of a joint effort of the American Medical Association, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the March of Dimes. It was the first committee on perinatal health. The committee's goal was to put together a plan to improve maternal health and lower infant mortality nationwide. Sadly, she died before the committee's landmark report toward improving the outcome of pregnancy was released in 1976. Dr. Apgar published more than 60 papers during her career, along with the book Is My Baby All Right, which she co-wrote with Joan Beck and published in 1972. Uh, This was a book that walked through several different congenital situations that can happen using Uh, real examples. It was a book that there was a great need for at this point because a lot of people had no knowledge of any of these things or or what to do. She also received numerous honorary doctorates and professional accolades during her career. She was given a commemorative postage stamp in 1994 and was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1995. Throughout her life, she continued to pursue all kinds of activities and passions in addition to all this work of being a doctor. So it sort of continued what she had been doing in college when she was on seven different sports teams while also being a great student. She also, in what maybe is the most awesome thing in this episode, carried a pen knife, an endotracheal tube, and a laryngoscope with her at all times just in case someone near her stopped breathing. She said, nobody but nobody is going to stop breathing on me. She, she really is her... medical Leslie Nope. <laughs> is she? <laughs> well, she's, so I have, I don't know. I just developed this deep fondness for her in this episode because she's like medical Leslie Nope. And we've told, we've told you all before how much I love Parks and Recreation and cried when it was over. But also her name is Virginia, my grandmother's names. 
And when you look at pictures of her, she's got like the same kind of uh, very from the 50s eyewear that you see on pictures of my grandmothers. She just reminds me of like if my grandmothers had been like Leslie Nope when they were young. (laughs) And she actually never retired. She only slowed down a little at the very end of her life because she had progressive liver disease, which eventually was the cause of her death on August 7th of 1974. She died at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, where she had spent much of her career. So we've talked a few times about the show Sawbones, which is a show about medical history, uh, which is the co-production of uh, Sydney McElroy, who's a doctor, and her husband, Justin McElroy. And uh, they are charming and delightful. If you don't listen to that show, I highly recommend it. It's from the Maximum Fun Podcast Network. I don't think they have done an episode that that touched on this, but the whole time I was working on it, when I got to this part where Dr. Apgar was like, the problem is nobody's looking at these babies. I just kept hearing <laughs> Sydney's voice in my head being like, you got to look at the babies. <laughs> look at the babies. <laughs> Why aren't you looking at the babies? Like, it seems so obvious. Look at the babies <laughs> when they're born. It does. I I have to wonder, and I I will, you know, show off my my ignorance in this arena, like what the thinking was, like why they weren't focusing on the babies and they were only focusing on the mothers. Were they just so accustomed to a high mortality rate that they were like, well, the baby may or may not make it. The strong ones survive. Let's make sure the mom gets through. I kind of wondered that as I was, uh, I mean, I didn't find a lot of of information about why this was the way it is, but because the infant mortality rate was so pronounced at that point, like it seems like maybe that would be uh, maybe not a deliberate conclusion, but just sort of like the operating parameters that were in people's minds as they were making decisions in in the delivery room. Uh, so yeah, I was very curious in my mind about that also. Um, I, I hope like nobody's grandfather was an obstetrician in 1950. I, I have not tried to be hurtful. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's seriously, just... looking at the babies made a big difference. <laughs> well, it's just one of those, you know, elements of like shifting approaches and attitudes that happen gradually over time. It doesn't always mean that the people involved were being negligent or even wrong. They just it hadn't shifted yet. No. So. Well, and we got we got a listener email that I have not read because it was just it was a little too personal to just directly read. But it came after that episode that we did about Dr. Vera Peters, where we talked about women who had lumps in their breasts would basically be put under to go get a biopsy. And if they had cancer, they would wake up without a breast anymore. And how like in today's mindset, that's horrifying. Uh, Her story was about having had children during this part of history and how basically you would go to the hospital and you would be put under and you would wake up with a baby. (laughs) Uh, And uh, she had this whole story about the doctor that was delivering her children had a clear preference for delivering male children and uh, said some things that were pretty insensitive when he delivered her daughter. So, yeah, uh, I would say that there is still a way to go in terms of, you know, women and babies getting the best possible medical care, maybe not so much babies anymore, but I know, like, there are still... I know my mom personally had difficulty getting doctors to take her seriously when she knew that something was wrong with her health and they just kept writing her off as being a stressed out female which was not what was going on she had a legitimate problem yeah so medical care better still room to improve Thank you so much for joining us for this Saturday classic. Since this is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar during the course of the show, that may be obsolete now. So here is our current contact information. We are at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And then we're at Missed in History all over social media. That is our name on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 